I was debating quitting filmmaking. I was literally on the very edge. I was basically looking into other career options. Like if Ben's paddle was sent off and it failed, I have zero belief or trust that that would actually come to light of day and we would hear it failed and that a prize would be revoked. I think there would be some excuse made for why it was fine or swept under the rug. How do you pick which paddles to review? It would have been the easiest six figures I've probably ever claimed in my life. People are gonna laugh about this. I don't think I've ever told this uh, in Pickleball, but is this good for trust or is this bad for trust? And so what can the most trusted paddle reviewer and content creator in pickleball share with us about this rapidly growing sport if you're like me you probably didn't know that chris olson also known as pickleball studio is a former competitive speed cuber and has a combined 15 years as a content creator and is a filmmaker having worked on several documentaries one of which is currently on netflix and on top of all that he is a 3-5 at best this is Building Pickleball. So, uh, man, I don't even know where to uh, start with this one. I don't know how many people know this aside from the people that follow your channel, but before Chris was Pickleball Studio, he has a very deep and wide background with speed cubing and life as a content creator he had a second place finish at the 2017 world championships someone created a mini doc about him missing the podium at 2019 world championships he's done a wedding team relay with his wife solo produced a documentary he has three world records three continental records he was the director of photography behind the netflix documentary the speed cubers if you haven't seen that i don't have netflix but from what I've heard, people have raved about that film, just being able to share the insights and kind of behind the scenes of uh, Speed Cubers. But um, yeah, man, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me, man. It's fun to be here. Yeah. Um, you're the first content creator. I wanted to make sure that that happened, that you were the first because you were definitely one of the first people to influence me as a content creator, as far as in the pickleball space. Um, it's amazing to see what you've done and the way you've built trust in the community. And I think, yeah, there's probably just a bunch of people that you inspire. I don't know if Will will say that you necessarily inspire him, but I just see you guys work together and the, the connection you guys have is like super, super cool. Um, yeah, there's so many. I have this like massive Apple Notes list of just things to talk about. Um, yeah, I guess we can talk about the first time we met. Yeah, let's do it. Yola Media launch day? Yes, yes. It was really funny because I had no idea you were going to this. And when I saw you running around with your camera, I leaned over to Will and I'm like, isn't that... Isn't that building pickleball? And he was like, I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure. I, oh, he probably didn't say pretty sure. He probably did say, yes, that is building pickleball. Because I wasn't 100% positive, but I was maybe 90%. And I was like, oh, dude. I was like, his, the podcast stuff he does is great. Dude, I appreciate that, man. When I, it was so funny. My brother and I were like outside the lifetime. We're like recording. I was like, dude, what kind of like cool like intro could we use for this? And didn't use any of it in the actual final video. But we were recording outside and then we walked in and then I see you directly like pretty much facing the entrance, but you're sitting on the bench and like everyone is gathered around you. I was like, damn, that's in Chris Olson pickleball studio. I shouldn't have even honestly, I, I'm surprised I was even there, but uh, shout out to Tom Nguyen over at Yola for extending the invitation and give me that opportunity. But um, yeah, then I saw you saw Will and I was like, holy sh I was like, damn, I must have made it. <laughs> <laughs> See, it's so funny even hearing that because even even being at the stage I am in pickleball, I still do not feel like a big deal at all. Like when people, you know, people will come up at tournaments they're like, dude, so excited to meet you. And, you know, like maybe they'll have the shirt on or something. And I, it's so funny because I'm like, I just feel like an average guy. Like I probably felt similarly to seeing you there because I remember when your stuff started coming out and you'd probably done a, a couple of them. I was like, shoot. I was like, as soon as this guy does this for another six months or even a year, like this stuff is going to be very rock solid. Like I don't know if you've watched it, but there's a, a channel, a content creation channel I love, Colin and Samir. 
the way you do your interviews reminds me a little bit of them and I love their stuff. And I think the same thing in pickleball, once it's like dialed in is going to be super good. Dude, thank you. Going into this one, they were definitely like an inspiration because they cover content creators, right? And like, yeah, I know you, Selkirk TV had done like a short video with you. It was like an interview. I didn't get to watch the whole thing, but I was like, okay, they've got them. I don't know how many other people we've done interviews with, but I was like, I have to, I have to get Chris Olson on just the content creator side. And also like what you're talking about just now about like people wanting to meet you is because you're very like authentic and genuine, it's, I know that because I've met you in person. I've seen like the way you've interacted with other people. I, it's funny. I like kind of recorded behind the scenes at Rockwall. Uh, that'll probably never see the light of day, but just seeing the way like you are around people, the way, dude, the <laughs> talking that <laughs> you deliver is just <laughs> next level. It's playing with you and you and Will playing against you guys was like, one of the most eye-opening experiences like how is this happening these guys are running across the plane of the court like just doing the most random stuff this looks like a cartoon this looks like tom and jerry and they're like whooping our ass it was like eight and one at this point <laughs> dude i'm not gonna lie i think one of my favorite things and my my local friends here can attest to this i love banter and i love trash talk but i never ever if anyone ever hears me trash talk i never mean it in a serious or mean way like i and i usually try and be very careful about when i say something it's not meant to be uh mean like usually i try and make it so everyone understands it's a joke but it's like it's just a way for me to have fun on the pickleball court and kind of like be loose with friends like if i'm not trash talking you it's probably because i don't feel like i'm close enough to you for you to feel like this is a joke or understand, but dude, I actually, my friends here, they always say, they're like, Chris, every time you start talking trash, you always start playing poorly. So my friends who are more serious, they're like, Chris, just shut up and play the game. I don't want to lose. <laughs> dude, once you dial it in, like people are in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> it's so much fun. I love it. It's so good. Back to content creation. I appreciate you like uh, recognizing and just giving me props on the video and the editing. It's honestly because of you, like you and I'm trying to think like you will, um, that pickleball guy, his content is, is good too. But I just look at like the people in the space. I was like, Oh, I either have to do it to this degree and it has to have this level of quality or there's no point in doing it at all. And sure. I was like, I'll burn myself out. I'll like spend however much money I need to. I'll spend however many hours I need to, but it has to be at this level or it's just going to be like lost with everything else in the sea of YouTube and all the content that's out there. So it's like, damn, you guys really like set the bar, which is awesome, right? Like that's, that really should be it at this point with a sport that's been in the industry for like 60 years. You just see a lot of stuff that's, uh, I would say it's more like efficient. It's it's quicker, but if you take the expedient route, you typically give up quality. And yeah, it's cool. I think you said you hired someone as well, right? Recently, yeah, I recent recently hired my brother on. So he got into filmmaking in probably the last year or so, and he's also super into pickleball. Like I play with him all the time. He's been in some of my videos, and I I'm just at a stage now where there's just so much going on and i just really desperately need and want more of my time back so we're doing a, a six month contract right now where he'll work for me for six months and then we'll assess after that like you know did revenue continue to go up can i sustain this but like yeah i hiring someone was a, a big move and something that's been super helpful so far how did you make that how did you come to make that decision like as a content creator it's a little bit different than owning I mean, they're, they're both businesses, but I think it's sometimes easier to jump on like, Hey, I need to hire like a marketing or admin or, or, or like sales product development in the other space. But when it comes to like content creation, people recognize your face, people associate your editing style with who you are. It's like, it, it's your entire, it's like your identity as a whole. So being able to also like give that off as someone who's been creative, like you've been creative for a very, very long time. Like if anyone hasn't seen it, C Y O the King. Yeah. 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 That's the YouTube handle. Like that channel has been around for over 10 years. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. 
So yeah, the question was just like, uh, how do you come to making that decision as a content creator? Yeah, I mean, it it really just came out of the fact that it's like, if I don't do this, I think it's going to be really hard to grow. And also, I just, there is not, even with him working for me, there's just not enough time in the day. I need to be on court hitting paddles. And then before my brother, I had to come back. I had to organize all the footage. I had to shoot footage of the actual paddle. I had to get all the stats for it. Then I had to edit the video. Then I had to write a blog. Then I have to post the video. Like, all these different things. And I basically with my brother, he now handles shooting all of the footage uh, of the paddle. He will shoot on court stuff of me. And then he does for now the first round edit of it and gets it probably 70, 80% there, there. And then I come clean it up just with some things that make it a little bit more me or just things that I think it needs. At some point he's going to be able to do the entire edit. I just have to kind of train him to that point. Uh, but yeah, a lot of it was just literally, I need this time back. Otherwise, I don't think I'll be able to grow. And also, I'll probably just burn out at some point because I'm probably doing like 60 plus hour weeks right now. And it's just like, you have to, even I'm a control freak as well. So like, I, I like to do everything and I feel like I can do it well, but you have to give some of that up at some point if you want to be able to work on all the things you want to do. You mentioned two things. One was burnout and control, man, like, I resonate with the control part, especially like it, I'm still very new to this, but I think that's just who I've always been. It's like, if I create something, I want it to be mine. I want to have like, I want to determine the creative control, the creative direction, but also you have like the fear that if you bring someone on, they might do it a little differently. And the fear of like, this could change the aesthetic and the vibe that your audience receives, but how was how was that honestly like giving that part up like that control yeah not easy i mean my entire time in filmmaking i was i was a control freak i did everything myself and you know i think that made a lot of things harder than it needed to be and i think really i just felt forced to do it because it was like man if i want to spend time with my wife or if i want to if i want to be on court more and play more like you just you simply don't have the time. And then I think as I've gotten older too, I'm just more okay with like, you know what may, it might not be exactly me, but that's okay. And in some ways it could become better than what it was originally. And I think that's important to think about. Like right now I would say my editing capacity is higher than my brother, but there's a very good chance that if this is the only thing he's working on, he becomes better at it than me. And then it's like, he has his own ideas. He makes the video better than maybe I would have. He's already thrown stuff in there that I'm like, oh, yeah, like I probably wouldn't have done that. But that's funny and I like it. And so now, you know, you start to build trust. And I think you really have to find the person you think can do that. And that's not easy. Like I got extremely lucky that it's my brother of all people. But those people are out there. You just have to find them. Yeah. Have you did you go through? like a bunch of candidates have you I'm imagine there's people that have reached out to you as well who've been like hey I'd love to help you out I've had a few people offer uh and I I just always turned them down one because I don't really have any proof of work two they're not in my area so that makes working with them a little harder um so I didn't even I didn't look anywhere else as soon as I realized my brother was more serious about this I was like, okay, we probably just need to try this because he literally lives half a block from me. I could walk to his house in like two minutes. So collaboration's very easy. And he kind of, he just knows me and kind of my style. So I don't feel like I have to teach him that much. And it's just, I don't know, working with your family and in some ways is easier, some ways it's harder. But yeah, I wasn't even going to try and trial other people. As was basically like, if my brother doesn't work, I'm going to have a long road ahead of me. <laughs> Are you guys twins? No, but people think we're twin. Both my brothers, everyone thinks like we're triplets, and I'm like, oh gosh, yeah, yeah. I remember like I've seen the videos where your brother's in. It was like Chris Olson 2.0. <laughs> yeah. We do look really similar. Every morning we're given a choice: the choice to sleep in, the choice to scroll through our phone, or the choice to start your day with what your future self will thank you for. I once watched an interview where the guest said we can choose to be a thermometer or a thermostat. 
The idea being that a thermometer is reactive while the thermostat is proactive. Every day is a new day. It's a new opportunity to decide to be better than who you were yesterday. Choose a piece of clothing that empowers you to live the life you want to live. Visit viori.com slash building pickleball to get 20% off your first purchase, as well as free shipping on any orders over $75. Enjoy the rest of the show. Dude, isn't that so tricky though? Like working with family, like you definitely hear it all the time of like, oh yeah, don't mix like business and family. But um, yeah, like the guy that was with me over at the Yola Media launch day, that was my brother too. And like both of us don't really have a ton of experience so we're kind of learning it together but it is cool to see that you you have that connection with your brother not what no, that's another thing is a lot of people don't even have that with their family members but also the trust the trust is huge right like you could probably trust your brother and not screw you over and yes trust that you guys have like a, a the dynamic that you guys can listen to each other and respect each other like you don't have to discover that or go through that and like find that for sure. Yeah, I think there's going to be things that will, you know, we'll have to navigate it because we're probably in the first month of doing this. There's not been any qualms, but, you know, I, there's lots of things I do think about where, you know, right now he he has flexible hours. Basically, he has like another part time job he's doing while he's working for me. And I tell him, I'm like, you can get your work done whenever you want. If you want to work at midnight, you can work at midnight. If you want to do it in the morning, you can do it in the morning. As long as you get it done before the deadline, I don't care when it gets done. But I, there are lots of things I think about where I'm like, okay, I don't want him to burn out by working weird hours or feeling pressure like, well, I have to have it done by this and I had to work this job, so now I need to work at midnight to get it done. So there's definitely things I'll have to talk to him about at some point that's like, hey, you know, if I am doing something that's making your life harder, let me know because like, you know, I don't want family dynamic to be weird because of working. And I thought a lot about this before I hired him. I, I was looking all over the internet. I was like, what are things you should avoid? Is hiring family a big mistake? And most of the internet actually says, don't do it. But just the stage everything was in, I was like, okay, I'm pretty sure we can deal with this. And it's not, you know, it is a business, but it's slightly different than like, I don't know, a brick and mortar store or something. So there are things that I was basically like, we're just going to have to work through this. Like if it doesn't work out, he doesn't have to work for me forever. But you know, if he does, that'd be great. Like if he continues to do a great job, like I'll happily keep him. Yeah. I think it was a really great idea that you created like a contract. It's like, and you also created like X, a certain time period that it happens. Yeah. And like, cool, let's give this a trial period. So you're not letting it be too much treat you're not treating it too much like it's family you're like hey let's not forget forget like the key business components and treat each other like this is business like you wouldn't do that with some random person right you wouldn't just be like hey let's just not even let's just forego a contract now you like created that um yeah i tried to make it as much and i'm still figuring out the best ways to do it but like first the six month contract was two things one hey let's see if this even works like are we gonna hate each other by the end of this and then two will I continue to have cash flow to sustain this? It kind of, I knew I could do six months at least. Then it'll let me know like, okay, at the end of six months, maybe this was working, maybe it wasn't. But I've also tried to add things in place. Like him and I have a Slack channel and a notion that we work out of. And I'm trying to make it, I told him, I was like, if it's business, put it in Slack. Don't text it to me because I don't want, it. I think it would be fine, but I just don't want him to feel pressure like, you're mixing personal and business in so many ways. Like I want those to stay separate. Like if I text him, it's personal. If it's Slack, it's business. So I'm trying to keep those as separate as possible just to keep things healthy. That is definitely like a lesson in itself. It's just boundaries, right? Like personal boundaries, business boundaries, wherever it is. Um, I know that some boundaries could have been used in this past weekend at MLP. <laughs> we'll get too far into that. Um, but another thing that you talked about was like burnout, right? Like when I look at CYO the King and just looking at your resume and your background, it's funny because initially I was like, oh, Pickleball Sue, he's been doing this for like a, a few years. Then I got to see the other side of it and you've been doing this for a long time. This is the part that I like am most interested in talking about is just the whole content creation side, but also like burnout. Can you think about a time where you did experience that and also like how, what was that experience like? And then also 
now it seems like every time I see you, you seem like you have a good head on your shoulders. You seem very like well managed, and you know I could be uh, attributed to like a, a number of things. But yeah, I would love to hear you just talk about burnout and managing it, and you know if you have any advice for people. Um, when I ask advice for people, I'm really just talking, speaking for myself. Don't I completely feel that I'm the same way when I'm at talking to people. I'm like, it's greedy sometimes. I'm like, I just want to know for myself. But no, I, I think that's a really good question. I definitely, I can think of one specific time. I've probably had, I would say really only two, but one was the biggest one. And it was between, so 2019, we filmed the Speedcubers Netflix documentary. And then that came out in 2020, I believe. And, you know, COVID obviously made things weird for everybody. I think I couldn't I couldn't work because, you know, no one could go anywhere. And the video landscape was kind of shifting to like a lot of online stuff, live streaming that I wasn't doing as much of. But there were several things that led to burnout. One, I was kind of getting out of speed cubing towards 2020. I was just kind of like, okay, I should focus more on my career and also kids were getting so fast that it was just really hard for me to keep up. It was like, okay, I've got this job and I'm trying to be the best at this. I can't do both. The job is going to take priority. I've got a wife now. And when I can't be the best at something, it really takes a lot of the fun out of it for me, uh, which isn't super healthy, but I'm, you know, working on that too. So when I was phasing out, it it was really kind of sad for me because I was like, this has been a part of my life for like 12 years And it felt like a big part of who I was. So that was bothering me. And then combined COVID with the Netflix documentary, every job I did after the Netflix documentary, first of all, I had like severe imposter syndrome because I was like, I don't even know how I got on this Netflix documentary. I think when you look at everything I'd done, it makes sense. Like I'd self-produced a documentary about speed cubing and I did everything on my own, editing, filming, blah, blah, blah. But the whole time I was just like, oh man, like, you're not old enough for this yet. Like you're probably not good enough for it yet. And then afterwards it was every job I did. I felt like if it wasn't meeting that standard or like pushing me towards something like Netflix, it was like, why are you doing this? And then it was like, well, maybe you weren't actually good enough for it. And it was a lot of luck. So there was, there was a ton of imposter syndrome. I would say for a year and a half, maybe almost two years, it was just really bad. And then uh, that's, you know, when I, right around the time I found pickleball in 2021 and uh, I was debating quitting filmmaking. I was literally on the very edge. I was basically looking into other career options. I was like, maybe I'll get into coding. I was learning Python for a little bit. And as soon as I found pickleball, loved it. And then I said, I'll never mix video and pickleball. And about two months later, I was making pickleball videos and loving it. And it was like this whole it was like my creative slump because that was another big thing with the imposter syndrome. My creativity felt very dead. Everything felt very forced. Everything about filmmaking felt so hard. I would basically look at a camera and resent the thing, but it was also what made me money. So I was like, I don't have a choice. And then once pickleball came along and I was making some videos for that, I was like, this is fun again. And I didn't feel like I was forcing creativity. Everything kind of just came back. Damn. Um, something that like a thought that came up was leaving speed cubing. So you had done that for 12 years. Like I had only, I had only pursued one other thing in my life for half that duration, which was professional fighting. And when I hit my last pro fight, which was my first and my last pro fight, I had like 10 amateur fights before that, but I had like a five year career. Once I hit that, for some reason it felt like a weight had been like lifted off my shoulders. But then at the same time, Like I remember just being super emotional, like crying to my coach and just telling him like I'm done, but it felt so bad because it felt like I wasn't accomplishing like the goal that I had set out. Like I made it further than I expected, but not as far as I wanted. So wanted to know, like, did you experience something like that? Like, you know, you had some podium finishes and you also held world records. What was it like leaving something that was a huge chunk of your life, like 12 years of your life. Yeah. I mean, it was extremely hard. I would honestly say to this day, it was probably one of the more difficult decisions because also some of my best friends I've ever had are from speed cubing. So I also, and I'm still friends with a number of them, but I kind of felt like 
if I'm not doing this thing, we're not going to talk as much. And then, you know, you just kind of grow apart a little bit. So it, it was a lot of things. It was the friendships. It was the competitive aspect. Uh, in speed, speed keeping was also partially my job. I used to make content for another YouTube channel. It was like an online retailer, similar to like a pickleball central or something. And so I just felt like I was walking away from so many things into something unknown. And I think I accomplished most of the things I wanted to do. I think I could have broken more world records or I had even expected myself to because I got into speed cubing like end of 2008. I would say by 2011, I was at the stage where people were like, yeah, this kid's really good. Uh, I was capable of breaking world records, but I don't think I broke my first world record until 2013. So like two years went by where I was capable, but I just kept barely missing, but I was near the top with everyone. And then I broke my own world record shortly after, and then someone broke it from me. And then I, I don't remember if it was 2014 or 15. I don't remember which year it's been so long, but I took the world record back, dropped it by a large margin. Eventually someone beat me by barely. And I just couldn't, I kept trying to beat it. Couldn't beat it. Couldn't beat it. And that, you know, I wouldn't say it was a down climb. Everyone's always like, Oh, did you get slower? I don't think I got slower. It's just that everyone else got faster because they had more time to do it. So I don't know. It's, it's a really confusing thing for me because I set some world records. I did really good. I was respected as one of the best in it, but I think inside of me, I always knew I could have done better. Like I could have won that world championships that I came second in. I, the there was one solve that I missed one solution on that had I done what I should have done I I could have won the whole thing 2019 where I didn't podium I could have been on the podium like I think there's things I missed that I would have liked to have but at the end of the day I still did I don't know I guess some pretty amazing things so I'm not too bummed about it but in terms of leaving yeah it was super hard I just felt like I was leaving a million different things behind yeah Dude, it's crazy to hear just like watching your mind go back and trace the things that you like these like opportunities that you like missed out on. But really, it's like I'm sure at the moment, dude, you gave it your best. You gave it your all. But that stuff, man, when you're chasing like greatness like that, it will that'll live with you forever for sure. But at the same time, I think that that's the stuff that drives you to be like who you are today and like with the what you've put out with the pickleball studio and like when you mentioned earlier like being the best can be detrimental or could be well yeah it's like a double-edged sword right like that desire to want to be the best um that made me think what is like your goal in pickleball because you did the brionis camp i've seen you play and you also like did rock all was that at four or five yeah four or five yep yeah and you guys you and will i think you guys are doing seattle ppa seattle too right I actually won't be the, the, so it filled up and we couldn't get in. The wait list got kind of long. So I'm skipping that one. I think Will will still be there for fun. And then Kansas the next month is what we'll both be doing. Do you have a goal for the playing side? It's really tough. I mean, I just, I want to just get as good as I can possibly be. Like, I think it's absurdly within reason to be 5 plus. I think it's even within reason to be, five, five plus, but to be the level that a lot of these pros are, you know, maybe making semifinals, I don't want to say that's not possible for me, but it's not possible while I'm trying to run this business. Cause I'll always put that first. Like that's what provides for my family, both my wife and my brother now, and you know, me. So that's always going to be the focus unless somehow someone was like, dude, I'll give you 300 grand a year to just go train pickleball. I'd probably try it. Why not? Uh, but content will always be first. So in terms of being a player, I don't think I have a set goal. It's just be as good as possible. I'd love to win some five Oh tournaments. But after that, like, I mean, it's only pro after that. So maybe, maybe in the back of my mind, it would be to play a pro bracket at some point and not just go in there and get, completely embarrassed but it's definitely not a a hard set goal i think all my goals revolve around content more than playing man either way whichever route like you pour your energy into i mean i'm sure everyone i could speak on most on the behalf of most people that either way it'll be like super a super exciting journey um but 
Would, uh, you've mentioned your wife a couple times, and it's it's. I don't know if hilarious is the right word. It's unique and rare that like I've seen the video of you and your wife doing like the the wedding team relay. Like, how'd you meet her? What's her background? <laughs> yeah, so we we actually met at a speed cubing competition, and <laughs> what's so funny about that is. So speed cubing is predominantly very young. I think the kid that actually just broke the world record like a couple days ago is he might be below 10, which that's a little abnormal. I would say the average demographic is between 13 and 16, probably. So not only is it very young, but it's also very male dominated. Like last I heard, which was a long time ago, it was only like five or 10 percent of speed cubers were female could even be less than that to be honest if you went to one of these it's a lot of guys so when i was i don't know can't remember how old i was when i met my wife 20 or 19 maybe uh i was at a competition in kansas and she was there and i was like oh my gosh i was like this person looks like she's my age not only is it rare to see a female at these but it's also rare to see someone your age in their 20s so somehow we just like struck up a conversation. She actually knew me from YouTube. Like she'd watched a bunch of my videos. So, you know, she knew me a little better than I knew her, but people are going to laugh about this. I don't think I've ever told this uh, in pickleball, but after that competition, I tried to find her on social media, could not find her anywhere. I was like, this person does not exist. So the only other place I could think to look was there was a, a Rubik's cube forum. I think it's speedsolving.com. Uh, it's just a Rubik's Cube forum. So back in the day, after a competition, there used to be these threads and you would just like tell funny stories or recap it, whatever. So I'm literally scrolling through this thing, looking for any female name. Cause I'm like, if it's a female name, it's probably her. I found someone that I thought was her, DM'd her on there. And we talked on that forum for probably two or three months before we finally exchanged numbers and then you know things kind of just escalated from there but i don't i don't know if people like really know unless they like go on reddit i don't think people know the whole like forum background and stories like dude i was part of like paintball like pb nation deviant art like dude forums back in the day used to be the thing i thought honestly i thought you were going what you're about to say could have gone two directions there's either gonna be a forum or casual encounters on craigslist and i for sure thought you were gonna go there <laughs> <laughs> yeah that, thank, thankfully it was the the forum <laughs> i always say finding my wife is like finding a unicorn of these things because again even if there was a girl at one of these they're probably like 15 so it's like there's a big age discrepancy here so it's like i never expected to meet uh a girl at one of these like yeah for sure <laughs> that's so awesome though um what does she do now she's a graphic designer Okay, that's dope. Yeah, she actually designed my logo, and she occasionally helps me with some projects for the channel. I try not to make her work for my stuff too much, but she's way better at graphic design than I am, so sometimes it's just faster. <laughs> yeah, dude, I saw the t-shirts uh, Forever 3.5. Dude, yep. those are awesome. Those are yep, sweet. Yep, those, those are all her design. <laughs> that's awesome. She seems like she has a variety of, like, flavors that she can like cater to because the the thumbnail for you and will's podcast that was created by her too right yep yep yeah very different and from she my... does she does great work she you know cartoon stuff illustration like she can do a bunch of stuff and they're all they're all awesome damn that's sweet dude so i just got back from mlp did you watch mlp i did not get to watch as much as i wanted to i trying to think i was wrapping up a project I don't remember which project probably doesn't matter, but I was working on a review or something. And then Will was also going out of town to Italy. Oh, that's what it was. We had batch recorded some podcasts. And so I was like, I'm just not going to have time this weekend. No way. Will is watching it the day before he leaves. So I, I, the only thing I saw was the final, uh, the regular final, not the super. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. It's just interesting. Uh, cause we had talked about it a little bit before this, but if anyone hasn't seen it, Chris and Will together created a documentary that's following Zane, uh, the MLP like road to victory for was it twenty twenty two? Uh yes, I believe so. Yeah, it was. Yeah, um, super cool. Just uh, yeah. So like Chris did that, and then um, I had an opportunity to do the kind of do something similar for Julian Arnold, and like I remember you and Will were just like, dude, if you have the opportunity, definitely do it. 
Um, but it was cool to hear just like your input on doing that documentary style. Cause you've done a, quite a bit of those, right? Like what was your job while you were speed cubing? Yeah, it was, it was just filmmaking. I mean, I worked in speed cubing from like age 15 to probably age 19. I had freelance clients, but I had, I was working for that speed cubing retailer doing their YouTube channel. So that was the bulk of my income. And then when the Netflix documentary came around, basically they, I was going to be gone for a couple months. They didn't think it made sense to keep me on salary. They wanted to do per project. And then I just decided like, I should just go all in on my freelance stuff. And so that's when I basically just went not as much speed cubing work and just like all regular filmmaking. Was Netflix, how did that Netflix deal? I know I was just trying to talk about LP, but since you only watched like the finals, there's not a whole lot to go into that. Um, it's a great match between the fives and the pioneers, but um, yeah. you also bring up another interesting topic is like Netflix. Were you working directly with them as like a freelancer? So how it worked was when I had done why we cube, which you can find on YouTube, that was the documentary I did. Uh, the person who directed our documentary, she had a son in speed cubing and she had been waiting forever to make a mainstream speed cubing story. Like, you know, she saw the impact it had on her kid and just thought there's a lot of great stories that need to be told. So she worked at Nike doing a lot of commercial agency stuff, or she worked at an agency that did stuff for Nike. And basically she approached me and was like, Hey, I loved what you did. You have access to all these people. You know all of them. You're clearly good with a camera. Like, do you want to be the cinematographer on this documentary? And then she had a bunch of connections that got us uh, a deal with Netflix. And basically how it worked for us is they gave our team a budget and just said, here's your money. Go make us the film. We're going to own the film. But we were essentially contractors for Netflix producing the content. Um, and then, you know, we assembled our team and then did what we had to do to make tell the story. That's interesting. Like something that stuck out was how Netflix paid you to essentially like create it. Have, have you seen deals? Like what are the other types of deals that you've seen? Like for something like what you did with Zane, I feel like that was a little bit different because you got to distribute that on your channel, I believe, right? Is it released yeah. on Zane's channel too? No, just mine. If there are any other details as far as like, how do you make that decision to, because that, that's honestly, yeah, like kind of selfishly asking even for myself, it's like, I was pretty adamant that I only wanted to do work that would exist or contribute to existing on my channel. But then there's other opportunities that come along and I guess they call it like spec work, right? You want to like create yep. work for what you want to do. So yeah, yep. I would love to hear like your thoughts on that. Yeah, well, I mean, honestly, Zane's project was essentially a spec project. Like, I approached him and was just like, dude, I think I want to do some documentaries in pickleball. Like, I like you. You know, we've we have some rapport. And I basically told him, I was like, look, if you cover all my travel expenses for, you know, going to your place and uh, like one tournament, I will do the editing for free. Zane definitely walked out way better on the end of that deal. The the amount of hours I put in, I was definitely losing money. But I did that one because I wanted to know for myself, like, does this concept even work in pickleball? Like, I think it would be cool, but maybe it's not. And then, you know, while I was doing it, I basically quickly realized I would much rather do my YouTube stuff than kind of my more traditional filmmaking stuff in pickleball. Cause for a while, that's what I thought I'd do. You know, maybe it was like Selkirk commercials or Yola or whoever and some documentaries. And then I was like, YouTube is way more fun and way less stressful. So about halfway through that project, I realized that and was basically like, after this one, I'm not doing any more of these. Like this just isn't the thing I want to do anymore. So it was essentially working for free on that one. And I think it's good to do, uh, it's safe for both people. You get access, they get a finished product. And then Zane just said, Hey, we can post it on your channel. Honestly, I would have been fine if, if he wanted it on his, I would have been totally fine with that. But I do think, I guess it probably balanced out with uh, essentially the free work I did that it went on my channel. Yeah. He's one of the rare, uh, pros that has an active YouTube presence. Um, yeah. Do you have thoughts on that? Like following Julian around and also just being around like 
putting myself in the shoes of someone like filming a pro when I was like at rock wall, right? Like I would look at pros and I'd like see pros just walking around by themselves. And I'm just like, to me, this seems insane. Like that they don't have someone following them around that they don't have someone like creating the content. And I, I get a lot of the obvious things, right? Like pay, uh, like resources and not having that. But I was like, to me, if I was a professional athlete in a growing sport, that would be like one of the first things I would look to as far as like, okay, how can I create, like generate some passive income and also just like create my brand and my presence? Like, yeah, I wonder what your thoughts are on that. That was literally the first thing I thought when I came into Pickleball. I was looking at Instagram followers of pros and I was like, they have nothing, like 5,000, 9,000. Like maybe the most when I started Pickleball was like 20,000. And I was like, this is so bad like coming from i i base everything off speed cubing because honestly there's so uh, an absurd amount of overlap between speed cubing and pickleball it's not even funny but uh the stage that pickleball youtube was in was like what speed cubing was 12 years ago so i was like this sport is so early like there are people in speed cubing with a million and a half followers on youtube and probably hundreds of thousands on instagram so coming into pickleball I was like the, your number one guy has like 10,000 followers I'm like this makes absolutely no sense to me so I did wonder like why aren't they doing that and also I thought well maybe I'll be the guy that helps make some of their social media content I pursued that for a little bit also decided don't want to do that but I think Zane is doing it absurdly smart he's doing it right like you build your brand so even when you are maybe not at the top maybe better athletes come in and phase you out even if Zane stops being as relevant as a pro player, his brand is going to live on and make him a ton of money after that. And I think more pros should be thinking about that. I do understand that some of them, they probably only want to play pro. They just want to be competitive. And I think that's fine. But if there is any inkling in the back of your mind that you want a business in this or you want to be relevant for a long time, you better start making content or doing something. You know, Especially if you make good money. If you're in the top five people you're probably getting paid very comfortably and you could afford to have some pay some people to do some content for you. I mean, look at Zane, like, I don't know what his placement is, but I don't know if I'd call him a top 10 guy right now. And he's got plenty of money to work with to pay other people to produce content for him. So all I'm saying is they should be doing it now while it's easy because content in pickleball, it's like a free for all. If you are remotely decent at making content, you will stand out and people will follow you and it's not going to be like that forever. You're going to have to work three years from now. You're going to have to work so hard just to even get noticed. And right now you don't have to work very hard. <laughs> that definitely is something that keeps me up at night. Even like, even myself, I'm just like, do you at some point someone like, I don't, I can't even think off the top of my head, but there's going to be like, I don't know, like someone like Pat McKinnon or someone like Gox that someone's just going to come into the industry and just start creating some crazy creative stuff and different angles that we haven't seen. I'm just like, well, <laughs> it's cool outlasted or you just like adapt, but uh, it's definitely terrifying to a degree. For for sure. I think about that all the time. Like, you know, am I going to be, am I going to be relevant or whatever if other people come in and, you know, I think that's just the, you always, you always got to be growing basically. Yeah. But it's cool because aside from like the creative aspect, I think when you, when you look at a lot of these uh, a lot of these like content creators, you just see that like the foundation that they built and the loyalty. And no matter what happens, even if there's someone like Mr. Beast that comes along and comes into the industry, they'll still have to somewhat like start from scratch. And they'll and like someone like you, you've created. I think you're, as far as like YouTube, you are like thirteen thousand followers, and people, you're like the most trusted source for paddle reviews and even yeah even in the podcast as well when people hear you guys talk it's people are like people listen with both ears which is huge um yeah i i think that's the the thing that helps me sleep better at night about thinking about being relevant is i try so hard to to build that trust like even just when i started pickleball it's like okay what do these these guys have these other content creators have things that i don't what can i build specifically that maybe they don't have or they don't have as much of and my immediate thought looking at the paddle review market was 
trust. Like I will be that guy that no matter who this is, I don't care if you're the biggest company in pickleball, I will tell you if they're if they're good or bad or you know, should you consider this, should you not? And I think something content creators overlook significantly is building trust. Like you, the in my opinion, the only thing I actually have or the highest value thing I have is my audience and their trust. And I do not ever want to do something to betray that because, you know, l l I'll just give a great example. A ton of my money right now as a content creator is from affiliate sales. If you no longer trust me because let's say I shilled for a product that was bad and you felt like I did it for nefarious reasons, now you're not going to use my code. Now you're not going to watch my videos. Now I don't get YouTube money. I don't get affiliate money. Maybe other brands who would have wanted to work with me don't want to work with me because my audience is uh, lashing out. So I put through so many filters like, is this good for trust or is this bad for trust? Is this good for trust or is this bad for trust? And like, I hope I, I never screw that up. <laughs> yeah. Trust is so hard to regain, right? Like, yeah. I feel like it's pretty easy to develop initially to a degree, but then like if it's broken, you're like, oh, you have to work just twice as hard than you did initially. Yes. Yes, for sure. Completely agree. Um, speaking somewhat of trust and MLP, I m synced up with Carl Schmitz. He was out there and I was like, dude, are you working the event right now? And there's some stuff that he didn't want me to talk about like on air i'll get them on like the podcast at some point but i thought it was kind of interesting that there's a th another third party that mlp used for the event it wasn't usa pickleball yeah i think it's pickle pro labs i believe oh is that it i think so i could be messing up that acronym a little bit but it's something very close to that yeah he had he had good things to say about them though he's saying like the, the chief guy he's like that chief guy is highly commended by the guy that Carl answers to. So he's like, they're at least in like good hands, but it is like cool to see the yeah. like, okay, now there's more than one, there, there's more than one company now that's in it that can um, be a tr source of trust, but also creates like good competition, right? Like you don't want, at, before it just seemed like it was just USA Pickleball and you yeah. don't, and I, there's a lot of people frustrated with them and you just don't know if you're the only one providing that service, then kind of comes back to trust and those things. It's like hundred percent. And yeah. USAP's trust factor is very low. People have, and I mean, look at it. If you look anywhere online, people have so little faith in USAP's ability to test paddles, to regulate them well. And I, it's not that I don't think they're trying. I think Carl's a smart guy and I think he's, he's working super hard and he's a very nice guy. But like, there's a lot of things they've done that have just damaged trust or made people weary. And I think as a brand as a whole, that hurts them. And they could have done a lot of things to uh, have better trust. And now every single thing they do to rebuild trust is going to be put through a filter of, well, we've been through this before. Is it actually going to is it actually going to be good this time? Kind of going back to what you said, where it's twice as hard, if not more, to regain trust than it is to just build trust from the beginning. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's tough to see because they have a lot of good intentions. But like you said, like there's, they're obviously trying. But yeah, it's very murky waters. So, something I saw from Fifth Shot Media, they put out a video recently that was recapping MLP. Mostly just the kind of controversial stuff. But I want to get your thoughts on the paddle testing. It seemed like they were only testing for deflection but not things like grit. Yeah, that's interesting. I think I might have heard that. I never looked into it uh, further just because, I don't know, grit's been less of an issue these days, or at least, I guess, less of the, the hot topic. I would find it odd that they wouldn't test for grit. I don't really know what the thought behind that would be, but I don't know. I, paddle testing seems to be in a decent place for the pros right now. It doesn't seem to be that there's a ton of issues and delamination seems to be going down, but I still think... From the manufacturing side and the regulation side, there's still a lot that needs to be figured out. Is there is there something that you think is missing from paddle testing? That like if you were if Chris Olson, Pickleball Studio, was the head of paddle testing that you would implement or look at? 
Uh, I mean, nothing that I can think of from a specific test standpoint. It would just be more transparency. Like that has been, I mean, again, it goes back to trust. It's just been the biggest issue. Like when a paddle sent off, I have almost no faith. Like I've heard several times on other podcasts now that apparently Tyson's paddle failed at Red Rock, but I didn't see anything about gold being revoked. And then it kind of came out that the refs claimed that Travis didn't challenge the paddle formally enough. So they didn't think it was actually a challenge. And then I'm like, well, why did you send the paddle off then? And there's all these things where I just have zero faith that if a high, like if Ben's paddle was sent off and it failed, I have zero belief or trust that that would actually come to light of day and we would hear it failed and that a prize would be revoked. I think there would be some excuse made for why it was fine or swept under the rug. So transparency to me is the biggest thing, but that doesn't, it doesn't add to the paddle testing. It just makes it better for the general public. Was there anything like that in speed cubing where like there's a possibility for like cheating and there's like a regulatory body? Uh, yeah, we did have a governing body and they always did a pretty solid job. I can't actually, funny enough, one of my world records actually had some controversy over it. It was the last world record I sent. Uh, basically what happened is when you're at a competition, you have a judge next to you and how it works is you go up to your station, they will lift the cover with the scrambled cube and you get 15 seconds to look at the cube and figure out how you want to start. At eight seconds, they say eight seconds. At 12, they say 12 because it takes about a second or second and a half when you put your hands uh, on the timer for it to start. So 12 is like, hey, you should go now. Otherwise, you're probably not going to start in time. My judge on my last solve or second to last, I don't know which, he got distracted and he didn't call out the time right. So when he said eight seconds, I was probably at 10 seconds. And when he called 12 seconds, I was at 13 or 14 seconds. So by the time I actually started, I was maybe a second or second and a half over my technical allowed time to inspect the cube. So the whole, the governing body had to get involved and like find out like, are we going to let him keep his world record? And basically they decided that it was the fault of the judge. It wasn't my fault. They didn't think that the extra time I was given uh, impacted the solve. So thankfully I was allowed to keep it, but so it's funny you say that because I, I actually had to go through this whole thing. But we didn't ever have uh, equipment regulations because with Rubik's Cubes, it's pretty darn straightforward. Does it turn like a Rubik's Cube? Does it have proper colors? Like there were certain things about um, like maybe the colors you were allowed to use or certain things. But for the most part, the the cube was so straightforward that they didn't have to regulate equipment. Damn. So there's like no way to rig a cube. Not really. Uh, the only thing that came out in the last couple years, uh, but the technology isn't there yet, is they came out with these smart cubes that have sensors in them, and they can Bluetooth to a phone. And so, like, on my phone, if I had that cube in another room, I could literally, like, in 3D, look at the whole cube and see where all the pieces are. And the app could even give you solutions for certain things. And, like, it could tell you how to set your cube up the way that that scramble is or whatever. So... There was worry about Bluetooth cubes for a bit, but the thing is most of the Bluetooth cubes, because of there being electronics in it, it was very obvious which ones had those things. And I don't think I don't think it ever became an actual issue, but that's the only thing I ever heard of being worried about equipment cheating. Yeah, just all this topic of like all this like regulation and stuff. I don't really know what the solution is because like in the UFC for MMA, they had this it really just came down to PEDs. That's really like the only way you could cheat or at least the most significant way. And they always had this governing body called USADA and they were the USA like doping administration. They had worked with like the Olympics. So they are like a third party and they had pretty much no, they weren't like providing any services that would benefit them. Kind of like USA Pickwall. They have like the court services, they equipment facilities. Um, they also have like their certification. So certification. So, it's interesting. I don't really know what the solution is. I feel like it's just gotta be someone very detached that I don't know, maybe I don't know how much if or if the UFC ever paid USADA, but I think that's probably a factor. Yeah, I think the whole Pickle Pearl Labs thing is a, a step in the right direction. I just still I get a little worried, even if you have a third party coming in, 
can they publish results independently of PPA? Is PPA going to tell them, hey, you can't publish certain things or MLP, whoever, you know, it just start. you have to worry or I worry about the governing bodies above them being able to say, here's what you're allowed to say and here's what you're not allowed to say, which again, is it just goes back to the transparency. But I think at a bare minimum, it's a step in the right direction. And I know they are working on different tests than what you set USAP has done. So I hope that it leads to better testing all around because honestly when i review a paddle i want to stop talking about if this thing is going to possibly not be legal it's honestly really annoying for me to have to put that in every video so i'd love if they get this figured out <laughs> how do you pick which paddles to review yeah so it's it's gotten really hard because there's so many paddles that come out even paddles that i think will be pretty good it's not that they get turned down. I basically give companies two options these days. I say, look, I have a lot of paddles to review and some of them are definitely higher priority than others. So I cannot ever guarantee that I will give you a review. But if you want to send me the paddles, I may hit them at some point if I see there is something interesting about it. You just have to be okay with the fact that there may never be any content made about this. Most of them agree to that. Uh, I would say it's like really, really new small companies that are a little hesitant to send product and not get anything from it. Um, and then, or the other option is, you know, just don't send it. And if you make a standout product, I'll probably come back to it. But usually what I'm looking for these days is either you're a big company that everyone wants to know about, be, you know, Yola, Selkirk, those kind of guys, everyone's always interested, or you have a defining feature that sets your thing apart. Because what annoys me as a reviewer right now is there are so many paddles on the market that are just, a clone of another paddle. And I'm not mad at the company. I don't even think they're trying to clone that paddle. I just think when they went to China and they wanted to build a paddle, you know, the factory said, hey, we can do this. And, you know, it's it's pretty good. They tried it. They liked it. Uh, and they shipped it. You know, they're not, most of these smaller companies are probably not familiar with paddles to the scale that I am. So they just have no idea. But I don't want to waste my time reviewing a clone especially if it's more expensive. If there's a $100 paddle and company B comes out with one that's 200 and it's the same thing, I don't really care to talk about it, to be honest, because I'm probably just going to say relatively negative things. And it's just a waste of time overall. The biggest thing I keep coming back to is how can I serve the most amount of people with the time I have allotted? So let's say I'm just going to pick two random paddles here. But let's say you have like a head gravity tour and a Selkirk Lab 006. I there might be like I'll make up a number. Let's say there's 20 people that just like really really want to know about that head paddle. There's probably thousands of people who want to know about the Labs paddle just as much if not more. So in the time that I can make a video, I will serve thousands more people doing the Selkirk one than I will the head one. Now it doesn't mean I'll always ignore those, but I just have to think about that cuz my time is it's finite. You can't review every paddle, even if I would want to. It's just not possible. Damn, that's a good takeaway, at least for me. Um, just the way you allocate your time to things, because that's definitely tough, right? Because they're like, yeah. I know those are just too random. Even speaking like hypothetically to that point, like Head is still like a relevant company, but yeah, that's definitely like got to be like a very tough decision to make. Um, yeah, I mean, and sometimes it, it bothers me too, because, you know, there will be other smaller creators that can, uh, move at a faster scale than me. Like, I still think I'm very nimble, but to keep my trust high, I try and be very thorough. And I think the advantage that smaller creators can have is that they can spend one day with a paddle, an hour with a paddle and never have to talk about that. Uh, which is fine. I don't even think that's a bad thing, but they can go, let's say they could try four paddles in a day and make four videos about it. And they're like, I hit them for like an hour and they can give a good opinion. It's harder for me to do that because people have come to expect more thorough information. So I can't move as quickly. And then it kind of bothers me like, man, I'd love to get to that paddle, but it just doesn't make sense to do that one right now. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's even a good point to like being a content creator is uh, opportunities will definitely come up and just having 
the ability to say no, but also having the ability to say no in a way that like keeps a relationship stable is also still like kind of tricky. Like I have some people yes. that reach out to me and they're like, Hey, we'd love to do a podcast sometime. And it's this the same exact thing that you're talking about, right? Like there's a company a, which has a larger following than company B. And it's not like I don't want to cover them. It's like, yeah, I absolutely do. But I'm like, okay, a podcast is typically like an hour long. Then you have to like go through the editing. And I only want to release them like once a week or really only have like the bandwidth for that. Um, something I don't know if you've mentioned in any of your episodes before, but it's kind of goes to the point of trust and we've talked about it, but, and okay, it's okay if you can't disclose this, but have you ever been paid for a review? Will you ever receive compensation for a review? How do you think monetize, monetizing off of a business to pay you for a review affects your kind of like, yeah, I guess the way you conduct business because like reviews are yeah. like over 90% of what you do. Yeah, 100%. No, I've thought about this a million times and I've had so many companies that are like, please take our money to do a review. They're like, we don't even care if you, we're not even asking you to say nice things. Like some companies have literally just been like, we just think you deserve to be paid. Like, please review this fairly. Do what you want to do. And it, again, all goes back to trust. I personally believe that a company can pay me and I can still do exactly what I do now. Like I, I hold myself to a very high standard that I don't think most people are even willing to consider going to. And like, I, like I'm a consumer in a lot of different things too. So like, I want to know what's good and bad. I don't want a guy that's like, Oh, well he was paid off and like says it. So like, I believe I could do it even if I was paid, but I don't think a lot of my audience would believe that. Let's say I review a paddle really positively if i was paid for that review even if it's like literally the best paddle that has ever come out on the market like let's just say it's leaps and bounds better i think there's going to be a large subset of people who always believe well he received money for it of course he said nice things and i think that's completely reasonable because influencers in so many industries have broken trust by well this company was willing to give me like fifty thousand dollars i'm gonna say whatever I can so that they keep working with me because $50,000 is a lot of money. So even despite thinking that I can do it, I refuse to do it because I don't think my audience will believe me. I think I could put a million disclaimers. I could give as much proof as I want that I'm being unbiased. I just don't think people would believe me. And it's not worth throwing two years of trust building away for a couple thousand dollars to review a paddle. Damn. Um, okay. So for the people listening, mm -hmm. that is huge. Um, and if you want Chris to keep doing what he's doing, <laughs> then, then view his sh Like subscribe to it, view, comment stuff, because it's not a vanity metric. That is absolutely how YouTube's algorithm helps a creator like himself be able to sustain a business which he's now trying to grow by hiring his brother and you know not only that but he has like merch too which i still need to get i still need to order one of those shirts maybe i'll wait till the forever three five shirts because those are i like those more um yes for sure but yeah like if you want to keep having this trusted source then support him in these ways because He's not going to ever take money. Clearly, he's never going to take the money. And we also don't want this guy to disappear or have any struggles with being able to fund the thing that the passion, but also like what he's providing as a service to our community. Um, that's awesome, man. That's like highly, highly admirable. And because if you took money, God knows where you'd, you'd probably be living in like, <laughs> you'd be living in like Bermuda or so, some like mansion in like, uh, the Maldives or something and we would never oh, see you again. You'd be like, it's doing... definitely, it's definitely crazy. Like I could, if I took money for every review I do, like I have a pretty great gauge of how much one of my reviews is worth monetarily to a company. Now, like I can see it just from the affiliate sales, like how many sales I've driven or whatever. And if I were to charge money based on like what that value could possibly bring for a review that is good, like, Man, I don't know. I probably I probably wouldn't be worrying about money anymore. That's for sure. So I, 
sometimes it's really hard to think like you could be doing better financially, but I just think long term you will you will gain money short term but lose money long term. And I want to be here for a long time, not a not a short time. Yeah, yeah. Man, you'd have a summer house in Chicago, man. It'd be uh no I'm in mean, a backyard court, that's for sure. <laughs> Dude, that's such a like such an admirable thing just in society like especially now with the way like the recession things have gone and the way like the economy is but also in, even in pickleball you see money there's just a flood of money going in but also money being pulled out and to be able to say mo no to money even outside of pickleball just at your core to be able to look beyond having a myopic view of what you're doing and have that long-term perspective is so I just, the only word I can, my vocabulary is very short, so I'll just say admirable again, but it's, yeah, very well respected. You're only what, like 27, 28 years old? Yep, 27. Dude, I'm, the stuff that, yeah, there's people like double your age and our age that have given away, like kind of just signed their souls away to money and to be able to see that you're doing that, man, it's awesome to see that it's rooted in morals and values and that you're not willing to change that for something like money. Um, well, it, it definitely, I will say it hurts sometimes. Like there was, I won't go into, into specifics about it, but I was, I was offered essentially a six figure deal to do exactly what I'm doing. I didn't have to, I didn't have to review any paddle. I didn't have to like, honestly, it would have been the easiest six figures I've probably ever claimed in my life. And there was just a couple, I, I was worried about a few trust things with my audience. I really, to be honest, it was a fairly minor thing, but like that one, I, I won't go into all the specifics, but basically I just ended up turning it down at least for the time being until I see some other stuff, but stuff like that kind of hurts when you're like, shoot, like, is that a smart thing to do? It's like, that that could be a year's worth of business expenses. That could be that could let you do certain things that other content creators can't do. And I, to be honest, I still don't even know if that was a smart decision. But yeah, it's, that might give people an idea of the scale that some of these things, where some of the things I say no to. Damn, dude, that is crazy to hear. It's awesome. I mean, yeah, like at the end of the day it's very clear that you're not like going to be trying, you're not looking for money to buy like a, like a Tesla or like a <laughs> something like materialistic, right? Like you have the sense for ethical wealth creation where it's like, Hey, what can I actually put this money towards? It's like reinvesting like kind of like Mr. Beast, right? Like all the money he gets so from what we understand, he reinvests it. Like you would probably buy like new camera gear. You probably buy like, maybe you could buy a studio. Like, yeah, actually, hopefully you would just buy your own studio that would be like awesome you would have so many projects and like be like mkbhd and have that robot that can like do all these like cool things and make your reviews like even cooler um which i don't even know how you're making the reviews already with the way like the way they look uh without having all that equipment so <laughs> one thing i forgot to talk about earlier that i think is important is i have had people ask me they're like okay companies don't pay you for the review but you get affiliate money and they're like, aren't, isn't that the same thing? And I personally don't believe it's the same thing for several reasons. One, if I took the money for doing a review, that's guaranteed income for me. And what I have learned very quickly is that when I give a paddle a negative review, my affiliate income is horrible. Like it actually still shocks me how horrible it is. There are paddles that I don't even hate that I might just say like, I think this is overpriced or there's a better value one. And my affiliate sales are still really bad on it. So the income is never guaranteed because obviously if you, the consumer don't buy it, I don't make any money. Uh, so that's how I view the difference. And again, like maybe I could lie and say like, oh, hey, this one has higher margin for me. Uh, I'll give it a good review. But as soon as you guys realize that you'll go, wow, this guy sucks. I'm not buying from him again. And then I lose all my affiliate money. So that is the difference in my mind. Cause I get people ask that all the time. So I thought it was, it was worth clarifying. 
now that we're on this topic of just like morals, values, and you know, I've, I've like taken away a couple of things of just like the way you allocate your time, trust, high standards, and as a content creator, really value, valuing, valuing and prioritizing the importance of your audience and how they like perceive you and that like keeping that trust. What advice would you have for content creators, young entrepreneurs, or really just anyone that, you know, some people might be struggling to find their passion or purpose in life? Yeah, I mean, I I think it's tough. Um, I, I have a TED talk I gave a couple years ago. It was about speed cubing, but if you just look up Chris Olson TEDx talk, it'll probably be the first result. And that kind of goes into like, finding your passion and, and turning it into a job because that's kind of what I went through. But I would say the biggest things are when you find something you're really passionate about, just look around and see like, okay, are there other people who are already doing this as a job? Is it feasible for me to do that as a job? And then it just expand from there because I think one of the things I feel extremely blessed to have been able to do is like speed cubing, one of my hugest passions. I was able to work in that industry basically all of growing up and then filmmaking. I loved that. And now I've been able to port that into pickleball, which is another thing I love. And what I found in between that transition period for me is when I could, when my career was not something that I also absolutely loved, I just felt like a, a sad person. Like I feel from two years ago, I feel so different. And it's because I was out of speed cubing and trying to just work for filmmaking, which t I did like. But there was a lot of things about it that just didn't feel fulfilling. And now in pickleball, I feel like I have this thing that really fulfills me. So I would say try as many things as you can, which is funny for me to say that because I'm usually reluctant to try new things. If you ask most of my friends, like whether it's a video game, a sport, uh, anything, a hobby, I'm super reluctant to start new things. But I think you won't find that thing you love until you just try a bunch of things, like go to things your friends invite you to. Uh, you know, like if there's another sport, like maybe, maybe try Padel, maybe you'll love it and be like, I'll be a content creator here. I don't know. But you just have to try and figure out what that thing is and then see if it's feasible to make money. Like maybe you absolutely, I'm just, I'll use video games because I like video games. Maybe you just love like Valorant or League of Legends. Could you be a content creator in that? Like, are you good enough at the game or funny enough that you could be a live streamer? Like what are the different avenues you could do within that? And maybe you try it for a while and if it doesn't work, then you move on, but you, you got to at least try it. Like pickleball was very much that for me. YouTube could have flopped and it been terrible. And then I would have just went right back to filmmaking. I think I don't, I wish I had the quote in front of me, but there's a great quote that goes something like people are more there. Oh man. How does it go? I really wish I had it, but it's basically people are fine being stuck in misery. Like they're, they feel safer in that than trying something new that's uncertain but could lead to better results. And there's a much proper, more proper quote for that. But I think that's so true for people is it's like they might be miserable in their job and hate it, but they would rather be there than try something new that scares them and like take a leap for something. And I think at some point you have to be willing to try that or you're just going to be stuck. Yeah, it's a terrifying thing that that's what society kind of pushes on people is to be complacent. They put people's self-esteem down and there's not enough people building up, building each other up to tell each other, like, just try it, like go out and do it. And it, if it doesn't work out, then it's really, really like not the end of the world would rather you try pursuing it than like living with that regret. And just like those questions, like those burning questions, like every day, like day in and day out, which eventually leads to people using like substances or, and that substance could be food. It could be just like food, could be drugs, could be like constantly looking at your phone just to like bury all those feelings down. And it's, yeah, it's definitely like a terrifying thing. And I appreciate that you say that because God, it's, I wish more people knew how easy it is to really just try something. Um, I, I think it's always, to be honest, and I need to get better about thinking this uh, for myself. Actually, there is a great quote I just found recently. It's actually my phone background, and I, I love this quote. But it's, uh, we suffer more in imagination than in reality. Like, people will think about, like, 
oh, what if I leave this thing? What if I left this relationship or I left this job? And it's like, oh man, it would be so terrible. When in reality, it's probably not as bad as you think. That's not to say there aren't scenarios where maybe it would be that bad, but I've learned for myself, like most of the time, the things I'm really scared of, it's worse in my head than it actually would be in reality. And I think it's easier to get back into your old job than you think it is or to go back to how things used to be. It's scary. I, I completely get it, but you have to be willing to try it. It's way better than being stuck miserable. That's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. There's like jobs that keep you there using like stock, like vest, uh, like vesting programs and like healthcare and all those like other things, which it's all like a lot of it's contextual, but I also like, I don't have any like beneficiaries or dependencies. So I personally, I don't even have health insurance. I'm like, I'd rather just like roll the dice and use that money towards like what I'm doing now. And yeah, like someone once told me is like, do things before you're ready. And that's actually like someone, what someone told me before I even started this. And I was like, you know what? Like F it, I will do that. And it's, it is definitely tough. Like everything, there's things that have come true that are positive and things that have come true that I foresaw that aren't great. Like I'll look at, I got, uh, the monetization, like the YouTube partner program, like activated. So just looking at like going from a six figure job as a UX designer to now looking at like, Oh, I'm currently making $27 and like 39 cents. And you're just like, but it'll figure itself out. Right. Like, but also I would much rather make this money right now obviously i'm not homeless so I, I like had some saved up but i'd rather make this than be in a job where i just loathed it i could not stand yep. going back to your thing about control i hated i hated absolutely with a passion which i didn't realize until i changed jobs that i just couldn't stand like all the pol politics and the red tape the permissions that you had to ask for other people and just like being in a job where you're constantly doing the same thing and it's like okay so in order for me to move up in this company, it depends on this person's approval, but also this person's tenure at the company. If this person's been there a long time, then I can't take their role. It's all these like weird politics. And as a content creator, you really have like uh, full control of your destiny. Like everything yes. that happens is entirely on you um, yep. to a degree, like YouTube and all the like algorithms and you know, the stats, it's a little bit tricky, but yeah, like, work in the work you put in is the work you get out is the results you get out. So, um, hundred yeah. percent. And I think that's the, the blessing and the curse of being a content creator is you, you get to do whatever you want and make your own destiny, but you also have to be the person who can tell yourself to go do those things. Cause man, there are days where I'm, I'm overwhelmed and you know, I'll just go like sit on the couch for an hour. Cause I'm like, I just need, I just need a break. But you know, your boss isn't going to let you do that at a regular job. Like you have that person that's like, get this thing done. And I always uh, joke, <laughs> people will <laughs> say to me all the time, like, Hey, can you come play like uh, pickleball, like in the morning or something? And I'm like, Oh man, I don't know if my boss will be nice and let me, let me uh, have the time off. And they're, always just, they're like, dude, you work for yourself. And I'm like, I'm, ha I'm mostly joking, but also serious because when you are your own boss, you are way worse to yourself than any, okay, I'm not going to say any, than most bosses you've probably had in your lifetime. Like I, I make myself work some crazy hours just because I'm like, if you don't get this done, like X, Y, and Z will happen. So it is a joke, but also it's serious. Like you gotta, you gotta have that drive to push yourself. Yeah. And that also like goes into like personal development. Like I think you're going to learn exponentially more about yourself than more about yourself if you're working for yourself than if you're working for someone else and that's in you know with a high level of certainty and in most cases but not all cases but yeah like the things i've learned so far is like things i never thought i'd be capable of and just having to go through processes and just like you said we suffer more often in imagination than reality you know long it took me to get my trademark and just like making a business checking account in my head i'm like oh this is so much to do it's like so many hurdles i literally walk into the branch 30 minutes later they hand me my debit card i'm like uh wait what <laughs> <laughs> you don't you have no idea how much i understand that the amount of this is a super small example 
but I hate making phone calls for scheduling appointments or like if I have to pay like my wife's health bill or something, I hate it. And I'm always like, this is going to take so long. Yada, yada, yada. I had to do one just the other day. Literally I called them and they were like, what's your card number? Bup, bup, bup. And they're like, good to go. Boom. It was like no more than a minute and a half phone call, but I had put it off for at least two days. And I'm like, you dummy. That was so not hard. <laughs> Dude, I've started to like realize I've had to like back to your point about you will be worse than like most bosses you'll treat yourself worse than like most bosses i've had to figure out my reward system like what will get me through like finishing this project of after i've spent like over like 50 or 60 hours a week like what do i need to give myself at the end of this project in order to make sure i'm not burnt out to make sure i like feel fulfilled so that's been like super super interesting it's just like what is my reward system like what yep. what am i motivated by what am i disincentivized by um but uh dude it's been like an hour and a half this has been awesome this has been like the <laughs> longest one uh yeah i guess my last question yeah one of my last questions is like who's been like your the most influential person in your life mm. yeah that's a good question i feel like i've had so many in different stages of my life i feel like i've had different I feel extremely blessed to have had different mentors for different things. Like, uh, you know, my uncle mentored me on a lot of finance stuff when I was young and I felt like that gave me a good background. And then I had videographer mentors, but I think the, I think the biggest one, if I really had to boil it down to like one or two people first would probably be my mom because growing up. So I was homeschooled and I was doing speed cubing at age 12 and throughout it, there were tons of family members. Like I would spend crazy amounts of hours doing this. Like I would literally six out six plus hours a day. I could spend practicing speed cubing. Like it's crazy. I'm not even exaggerating a little bit. If you ask any of my family members, they can tell you how crazy it was. And even through like family members ridiculing my mom and being like, he should be focusing more on this. Like this thing's a waste of time. Like he should do a traditional sport blah, blah, blah. She always pushed me to continue doing it because her view was always like, if they're, if my kids are interested in this thing, I think I should just let them explore it. And if at some point it fizzles out, it fizzles out, but I'm going to keep pushing them as long as there's no like obvious negative downside, like it's going to make them a criminal or something, you know, it was within reason, obviously. And I think that was one of the best things I ever had. Even with filmmaking, I decided not to go to college friends, family members thought that was an absurdly stupid decision. I had so many people tell me, you're never going to make any money. Like if you don't go to college and get a degree, blah, blah, blah. Anyone who hasn't gone to college, they all know what this feels like. And it's so annoying. And my mom took a bunch of ridicule for that too. And she was like, no, like do your thing. You want to do filmmaking, go do it. And I think what that gave me as an adult was the ability to figure out what I want to do, how to get it done. And also motivation to know that like this is this is on me to figure out. Like if I want that thing, I'm not I don't go to a person and you know, I might seek out advice, but I'm not dependent on someone to make that thing happen. I just realized like it's on me. If you want that, go make it happen. And I think she gave me basically all those tools to do that. And then I'll also give credit to my wife because she is a huge Huge supporter. I mean, <laughs> I work, I have not clocked my hours per week, but I guarantee it's 60 plus, maybe 70 plus hours a week. And I, there will be days where I work all day uh, making videos. She gets home at like five and then I go play pickleball, which is, it's actually work because I'm filming, testing a paddle. So, and then I'll do that from like, let's say seven to nine. I'll come home. Maybe she's getting ready to go to bed and then I'll go work some more. So there's not many people I think in relationships who would be that willing to tolerate that. But I think she sees where it's going and what good has come of it so far. So she also just pushes me to like keep doing it. And I've heard from so many people that don't have spouses that give them that support. So it's like, I feel extremely blessed to have that support. Dude, that's awesome. Your mom, like first off, not guiding you in any sort of direction, not like trying to be like a helicopter parent and letting you 
learn life, really just experience life on your own is so like admirable. I'll just keep using this word, but admirable as well. That's awesome. Uh, especially like, coming from Asian parents myself, it's that's just not the case. And I would, there's that pros and cons, but also your of wife. Of course. Yeah. Also your wife to have that, uh, like the wherewithal to delay gratification, right? Like she didn't, to just believe in you from the get go and just in the beginning when things are probably very rough and you just a high level of uncertainty and to be able to delay gratification is also again very like admirable trait that in today's society goes usually unseen um or overlooked hundred um, percent there's a quote i you know not everyone loves him i i don't agree with everything he says but uh dave ramsey with some like financial stuff he always has this quote that's like uh you uh, i'm i'm blanking on all these quotes today but it's basically like you have to live right now like no one is willing to live so that you get to live the way no one I'm blanking, but basically it's like you have to kind of suffer a little bit now so you get to live the way no one else gets to live later. And I think my wife thankfully understands that like my goal is not to kill myself with 70 hour weeks my whole life. Like I want systems in place eventually where employees are helping vet paddles for me. I'm still the one on camera, but like a lot of grunt work is taken off my shoulder and then, you know, I can spend more time with my wife or, you know, my siblings or whatever, like at some point I want it where there's a regular season every year where I'm basically just gone. Like whether that's two weeks, a month, I don't know yet, but I want to get it to where the business will keep operating. I can vanish, come back recharged and then like amp everything up again because I'm fine grinding now, but you can't sustain that forever. And I also don't expect my, my wife to watch me grind forever. <laughs> Yeah, and you made a good point about that, right? It's like you can do it forever, but it's just like the hard work versus like smart work. And yeah. sounds like if you can outsource or like hire employees and build treat it like a business, it's a lot smarter. But um, I'm, you said it early in the podcast where you said like the people can look at it in many different ways. I don't know what it's called, a personality trait maybe of just like being the best. I'm glad that you have that in you, and I hope that. You don't ever really change that and that you just find the right way to direct that energy because being the best is something that's so rare and so rarely seen nowadays because there's just like this like toxic view on like how being the best and having a really hard work ethic and chasing your dreams is, you know, the, it could be a waste of time or people just view it as like, oh, well, you should take a day off. I'm glad that it is something that you see but you're not ignoring as far as like yeah. how to tr treat your mental health and everything like that but man it's such a rare personality trait to have that and it, it's very well seen in everything that you do it's very apparent um but yeah it's been a long enough call i'm sure you got tons of stuff to do so uh i just want to give you a chance to you know plug away yeah let people know like what you're up to what they can find if you want to give any shout outs you know moments all yours yeah, for sure. I mean, first, I just want to say thanks for having me on. This is definitely, I haven't done that many interviews in Pickleball, but this is definitely my favorite one. I think there's a lot of, you know, I think when people think of me, it's like, oh, well, this guy just like reviews paddles. And, you know, I feel like I get asked a lot of the same obvious questions, which is fine. It's, I love talking about it. That's why I do it. But I feel like you, you unpacked a lot of things that not, I haven't gotten to speak about before or it just didn't make sense to talk about on my platform because it's like well you know i don't know if people will care but anyways i think you did a great job you asked a lot of interesting things and stuff that also just made me think like huh why do i do it that way or whatever but in terms of plugs like not much i mean uh you know website uh pickleballstudio.com same with youtube pickleball studio it's basically pickleball studio everywhere if you want to follow me um yeah, not not much other than that. I mean, you can join my newsletter if you want on pickleballstudio.com. That helps or, you know, buy some merch, use my codes, whatever it is. I appreciate I appreciate all the support. Yeah. Everyone keep supporting this guy because like you heard in there uh like a 30 minutes ago, is he's not taking money from companies, which uh is yeah, you can't help but commend him for that. And damn, man, thank you again for giving me the opportunity to share your story and yeah about like an hour and a half to, to chat but uh yeah looking forward to catching up and i'll hopefully see you at some point again this year but um 
yeah, man, if you're in Austin, hit me up. For sure. Thanks for having me, man. Sweet.